Um, <clears throat> my daughter Raylan has had many surgeries over the years, uh, including eye surgeries, ankle surgeries, hip surgeries, and spine surgeries. And, I, and as I'm sure we all know, um, surgery is no small thing. Um, there are many precise things that need to happen during each procedure, and, and if anything were to go wrong at any stage of the process, we could have a big problem. Uh, prior to the surgery, the, we usually go over all, all of the, um, the procedures over uh, with the doctors, and, and he explains all the things that need to happen in order to have a successful surgery. And, and I'm glad that the doctors know all those necessary steps because it's, it's long and complicated, and I certainly don't have the education to do all those things myself, right? And I'm glad that they know how to do all those things. But when it comes to surgery day, do you know what they basically say? We're going to cut her up, fix her up, and sew her back together. It's a complicated process, right? But when it comes down to it, it's actually very, very simple. In the same way, the Bible contains the most profound wisdom and instructions. And yet it's also incredibly simple. It contains the most difficult commands to follow, like be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And yet, also the most simple commands to follow as we're simply encouraged to rest in the grace of God. This is a picture of Santiago Sanchez, who lives in El Salvador. Um, in 1998... Santiago began digging a hole. He began digging a hole. He says that God told him to dig this hole, and he won't stop digging it until God tells him to stop. He's been digging it now by himself with a shovel for over 20 years, every day, most of the day, every waking hour devoted to digging this hole. Only Santiago ever goes into the hole now because uh, there was a news reporter when they took this picture who attempted to go down into the hole with him, and they just couldn't manage all of the dust and all of the debris and the, the various ways that he's dug this hole to get down into the earth. So only he ever goes into it now, so only he knows how deep it is, but it's estimated that it's now over three miles deep that this one man has dug by himself over the last 20 years. In an interview with his wife, she said, there are people who say that he's crazy. But no one knows what God's going to demand of you. Now, I don't know if God really told Santiago, Santiago Sanchez to dig a hole. <laughs> um, but that's actually besides the point this morning. The point I want us to focus on is simply his obedience. His obedience. Santiago was convinced that he knew what God wanted him to do. So he spent over 20 years doing it and doesn't plan to stop. You see, the thing is, God has told us very clearly what he wants all of us to do in his word. So the very simple question is, will we obey him? Romans chapter 16 verses 25 through 27 says this now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures according to the command of the eternal god to advance the obedience of faith among all the gentiles to the only wise god through jesus christ to him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that you are strong and able to strengthen us in this gospel. And I pray also that we would do uh, what it is that you called us to do, that we would recognize that all glory is yours, that we might not seek to steal any glory for ourselves, but praise you for your goodness toward us all. Help us to be obedient in Jesus' name. Amen. 
After about a year and a half now through reading the book of Romans, uh, we've now finally come to the last message in our study through this letter. Romans truly is one of the most theologically packed books of the Bible, as it clearly lays out our need for the gospel, that it tells us the simple gospel message and how we ought to live now today in response to the gospel that we proclaim to have received. So, just real briefly, uh, kind of summarizing the book of Romans, we've been reminded that we've all sinned, that we're all in the same boat in regards to our sin and deserving judgment. Romans 2.1 says, Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. We've also been reminded that we can't earn our salvation for ourselves through obedience to God's law. Because it's the law that proves that we're sinners. Romans 3.20 says, For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. That's how we know that we're sinners. And so we've been reminded that salvation is only found through faith in Jesus, not by our works, but through Jesus' work, who died for our sins. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. See, Jesus paid the price for us so that we can have life in him. And therefore, we've been reminded to live for him. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So, we should consider ourselves dead to our old self, because we are, and then made alive in Christ. We're not just to give God part of our lives as if if we're clinging to our old dead self, but all of our lives as we walk in newness of life. But as we do that, as we begin to do that, basing our lives on the gospel and now seeking to live a life that's wholly devoted to God, we might ever so subtly begin begin to think that this Christian life And therefore, life itself, maybe even eternal life, depends on how well we can live out the Christian life. Maybe you've thought, ever so slightly, that your relationship with God at any given moment depends on you. Have you ever thought that? That, that maybe your relationship with God, because you've messed up in some way, is now shattered? It's not true. It's not true at all. So as Paul concludes his letter to the Romans in our passage today, he writes in verse 25, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ. Now stop there for a moment. That's God. That's God. God is able to strengthen you according to the gospel. The gospel, of course, is the good news. It's it's really the best news. And, And yet it seems like a lot of people continue to think of it as bad news. Instead of seeing the gospel as our invitation to freedom from sin, many people wrongly see it as a threat to sinners. Believe in Jesus! Or else. Turn or burn. Trust in the God of love, because if you don't, you'll experience his wrath. And of course, that's part of the Bible's message, isn't it? We can't, we're not going to gloss over that and say it's not. It is. The Bible does tell us to respond to the, faith, to the gospel with faith and repentance, and, and these are certainly necessary for salvation. But if we proclaim the gospel in this way, we seem to have missed the heart of the gospel message. It's part of the Bible's message, no doubt. But it's not all the Bible's message. The gospel isn't a threat. It's a proclamation. It's a proclamation of good news. Jesus is the Savior of the world. I think this is why so many people think that they need to get their lives together before coming to church. We, get, we give off the impression too often that, that 
God will only accept us if we're perfect, which is, too, which is true to a degree, right? <laughs> so, but we give off this impression, so, so people think that they need to strive to be perfect before coming to church, when in reality, it's God himself who makes us perfect by grace through faith in Jesus. So Paul is making it clear in this passage that living out the Christian life doesn't depend on us, but on God strengthening us. That, that, that part, that's part of what the Holy Spirit does in us. Although because of our sin, we cannot glorify God perfectly. When we place our faith in Jesus, we're made new. We're new creations. And the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and strengthens us so that we begin to live lives that glorify God, starting in this life, and then extending out for all eternity. That's the gospel. Sometimes we make the gospel as a turn or burn kind of thing, but that's not all of the gospel. The gospel is how God is making us completely new. And it's all by his strength, his power, his Holy Spirit. See, we've often taken something upon ourselves and required something of others that was truly never our responsibility or their responsibility in the first place. Um, see, if, if we were able to live out the Christian life by our own strength, Jesus would not have had to die for us. It was precisely because we all fail that Jesus paid the price for our failures. So as we share the gospel with other people, we don't uh, do it proclaiming our goodness or, or how good they need to be in order to be accepted by God. Like, we, we don't tell people, and none of us do this, I hope, we don't tell people, just come to church and God will accept you, right? We don't go around saying, be a part of, of the church, be, come, come together with a group of people on Sunday mornings, and then you're, you're good for all eternity. That's not the gospel. We proclaim Jesus, who was pr completely good, and yet died in our place because we sinned and fell short of his goodness. Period. End of story. Place your faith in the Savior who saves us from our sins and then begin to rejoice in him by doing all these other things. See, Jesus coming to the earth to save us from our sins wasn't just part of the plan. Like, you, you accept Jesus and then do all these other things and then earn salvation. That, it's not like Jesus was just part of the mix. Jesus is the plan, and it's not a backup plan either. Jesus was the plan from, God's, uh, from the very beginning. This is exactly what God planned all along. Look at verse, uh, the end of verse 25. According to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures. In other words, what was hidden in centuries past is now made crystal clear in Jesus. And even in all the pr prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus— for thousands of years, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there was this mystery about what God would do about it and how God would save his people and how that would all play out. And in the prophetic scriptures, there are all these kinds of statements that point forward to the coming Messiah, and yet they were mostly veiled because history had not yet unfolded. But when Jesus was revealed... The silence of the ages was broken, and all history, not just biblical history, but all of history, now makes perfect sense. It's kind of like a surprise birthday party. Have any of you guys ever been to a surprise birthday party or had a surprise birthday party? A few of you over there. Um, just before a surprise birthday party, things can get a little weird, like... Um, your spouse might lie to you a few times. You might catch them in a few lies. Like, why are they lying to me? They don't, they don't lie to me. What's going on here? Like, your, your family checks on you to make sure that you'll be home at a certain time. Like, they, they never check on me. I'm gonna, I'll be home when I'm home, right? But, but not too early. They don't want you home too early. Make sure you're out doing a couple things first. You got a couple errands to run. I'll give you a few things to do if you don't. And, your fa and then your, your, your family acts all nonchalantly about your birthday. Like they almost, they kind of forgot it. And you're just thinking, that's, that's not like them. They forgot my birthday. I'm kind of offended they forgot my birthday. What's going on with my family right now? And as you walk into your house, all the lights are off. Even though you, you saw your spouse's car in the driveway, what, what is going on here? Maybe even an extra car or two parked down the street that you noticed. 
But then when you walk into the front door and they turn the lights on, everyone jumps out and yells surprise, right? And all these little things finally make sense. You see, all of the Old Testament was leading up to God's surprise. When Jesus was born and lived and died and rose again, we finally saw what God had been up to all along. So, what's God been up to? Into verse 26. According to the command of the eternal God to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever. Amen. See, God has been on a mission from eternity past to glorify his own name. And he accomplishes it through Jesus Christ. Jesus, yes, died for our sin and he's our savior. Amen. But you know what? That's kind of a byproduct of what God really was up to. Praise God for your salvation. Praise God for his love toward you. But God's got an even higher plan than that. He's glorifying his own name because God deserves all glory. That's God's mission. And it's not even so much that he lacked anything in his glory in eternity past, before he did all this stuff. It's more that just he desired to magnify his glory. Like a magnifying glass can see how small an ant is. God wants a magnifying glass on his glory to show how big it is. He wanted us to see his glory. He wanted to allow the nations, the, the, the Gentiles, to see his glory. He, and he accomplished that in his wisdom through Jesus Christ, dying on a cross, spilling his blood. To us, it seems kind of reckless. Why would the Son of God and God in the flesh need to die like this? And yet God chose to do it this way through the death of his Son to demonstrate the abundance of his love for us. And to many, it's, it might seem foolish so we say that we preach the foolishness of the cross, which is really the wisdom of God, so that we might become fools for Christ. I, I fear that most Christians today, most of us, have been far too concerned, however, about our own dignity. Rather than embracing this reckless seemingly foolish message that God brings forth and invites us to be fools for Christ so that the whole world would look at us and say, man, those guys are weird. Far too often we're too concerned about our reputation. When David uh, danced before the Lord, um, his wife saw him. He was, he was dancing half naked. Um, and his wife said, you're, you're above this. Aren't you, where's your dignity? And, and David responded, I, woman, I'm going to become even more undignified than this to worship my God. Do we have that attitude before God today? We care far too much about how others view us. We don't want to be labeled as Jesus freaks or religious fanatics. So we have faith in Christ, but we keep that faith to ourselves. And in so doing, we withhold salvation from others because we haven't proclaimed the gospel which we confess to believe. We've neglected to be obedient to the Great Commission. But I wonder if we've neglected it, once again, because we've taken something upon ourselves that was never truly our responsibility. See, it's not our responsibility to make people believe. We can't do that. All we can do is be faithful to plant seeds, and then God brings the growth. All we can do is point to the Savior, point to God's goodness, sprinkle our conversations with grace. The Bible refers to it as a seasoning it with salt. Everyone likes salt. 
season your conversation with salt. As people hear the joy in your voice and see the goodness of God, they'll ask you for the hope that you have. Be ready for that. Paul wrote in chapter 1 that he was called to preach to the nations to bring about the obedience of the nations. Man, that sounds like such a high goal, right? Paul, Paul thought it was his job to bring about the obedience of the nations. Wow. And now he writes, as he's concluding his letter to the Romans, the same thing again, that we proclaim Christ to advance the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. That is, that is the nations. That is us. So we're to preach, commanding all people everywhere to repent and obey Christ, knowing that they will, not because we're so persuasive, but because God is able to strengthen us, and he's able to bring about what he's planned. We proclaim a victorious gospel, not a weak gospel, but a victorious gospel in Jesus. You may have heard the acronym before that the Bible contains our basic instructions before leaving earth, like B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth, right? And I think that's true. It tell, the Bible certainly tells us what we ought to do. It gives us instructions to follow. But I heard another acronym recently, which also rings true. The Bible can also be described as the beautiful invitation to be loved eternally. See, the Bible is not primarily about what we need to do. It's not a book primarily about rules to tell us how to live. It's God's love letter to us. Um, it's not about what we need to do primarily, but about what God has done and will do for all of us. And God's goal for us is that we be obedient from the heart. But in order to do that, Jesus died on the cross to forgive us. And the Holy Spirit came into our lives to strengthen us. God gave us a new heart. He's like the master surgeon who cuts us up, fixes us, and sews us up so that we would desire to obey God, not out of obligation or fear or anything else, but out of love because of how he first loved us. So to him, to him, the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you